evening. Hi. This is usually a smaller class than usual, no? Usually it's like the whole, school, the whole class is full. Had you ever seen the previous class? No, you probably haven't. Hi, uh, my name is, is it too loud? <coughs> Maybe I should actually do a little. Oh, okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Farid, and as uh, Chingli mentioned, I uh, teach in the engineering department at Sonoma State University. The courses that I teach are basically, um, they have to do with internet technologies, how the internet works, how wireless systems work, and how do our cell phones basically actually operate and allow us to actually make phone calls. So most of the topics that I actually talk um, in my classes are basically related to these similar uh, topics like communication systems, your radio, your internet, and how they are actually put together. And one of the things we never really get to talk about is, so what's the impact of all of these things in our lives, right? So because I teach all of these things, it doesn't really make sense for me to actually be against any of them because I'm effectively, I don't want to put myself out of business, right? So my deal with all of these is basically whether these technologies are really helping us in becoming better, whether they are actually, we become more productive individuals, are we actually liberating and having more time, or are they in some ways, they are actually putting us under control and monitoring. So, and the answer is really not so black and white, and more than anything else, it's basically just understanding both sides of the story. That's really what I'm interested in. I'm particularly interested in these kind of lectures because this is a really cool platform for me to be able to talk about these things, which otherwise I probably never actually get to talk to them, especially about them, especially in my classes. So this is the fourth time that I'm actually uh, basically presenting a similar lecture, but every time we actually try to touch upon uh, some of the most recent events and news. So, by the way, if you actually think about it, in the last maybe three, four months, anything related to technology, anything related to internet that was kind of like really a big news that you've heard of? Have you heard anything big recently? No? Nothing? Yeah. Right, so there was a business acquisition actually. Also, for example, do you use WhatsApp, for example? Facebook bought WhatsApp. So somebody else had a, yeah. Sorry? Exactly, so there was a big hacking. Maybe you heard about that. You like, a lot of servers actually went down. Uh, that was one of the big stories last week. Um, a couple of months, no, actually a few weeks back, there was this uh, Yahoo announcement that there were like a whole bunch of email accounts got hacked, right? And then um, maybe another news was that the Snowden movie came out. Have you guys, anyone has seen that movie? Yeah, that, that might be an interesting movie. That's something that you may want to consider. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to usually make in these talks is that, you know, technology inherently, you can't say whether it's good or bad. It's just how we use it, and it's just how it's actually being used. So that's really the main focus of my, my talk always. But at the same time, in this particular talk that we have today, I'm basically just looking at some of the enabling technologies in our cell phone. I just uh, arrived a few minutes before the video that while you were actually watching that YouTube video. And in some ways, um, I agree with a lot of these things that the video was, was showing, but I also want to point out that a lot of these things that's happening, they say government is actually tracking, advertisers are tracking, a lot of these technologies that exist, they're really exploiting what already exists in your phone. They're not really doing anything weird. They're just basically exploiting the enabling technology which is already in our devices. If you understand what our devices does, then you can actually see how easy it is to do any of these things. Now, whether you're government, whether you're advertiser, or whether there are other agencies. So this is really what I'm trying to point out today in this talk. So to continue, I basically just start talking about internet. Like defining internet, what is internet, and what is our in understanding of what internet basically is. So, in very general term, internet is referred to as the mother of all the network. 
The internet is a system, it's a communication system that basically connects all the devices around the world together. When we talk about devices, we're talking about more than 5 billion devices. Everything from refrigerators to cars to computers to cell phones, etc. So these, the internet technology is more like a highway system that basically connects all the houses together. That's basically what the internet is. Now, the internet technology is actually exploited by what we call World Wide Web. So World Wide Web is basically just a technology which exploits internet to provide a lot of services. What kind of services? For example, we can do chatting, we can actually send email, we can listen to music, we can send emails, we can share files, and etc. These are all different services which are provided to us through these World Wide Web servers, which they effectively use the internet. So, now, how do we actually use World Wide Web? Well, you actually use it every day. You use what's called the browsers, right? You're probably familiar with many of these browsers, Firefox, Safari, Google Chrome. You use these software to actually use the World Wide Web capability in order to be able to use these services. So how do we use these browsers? Well, you have to have internet-enabled devices. For example, you can use your cell phones, your computer, but you know, nowadays we actually use cell phones, of course, but the, the devices were not always the cell phones, of course. Many years ago, the computers were as big as an entire football field. Later on came PCs, the, what they used to be called the personal computers, PCs. And then after that, we had these mobile capability in form of having laptops. So now everybody was happy that I can actually carry on my laptop from one place to another and do co computing. Later on came these cell phones, cell phones and tablets, which we are commonly used right now. And today, we actually see a lot of people using these very watch-sized computers that they, for example, Apple Watch is basically a very, very powerful computer which, is, which can actually sit on your wrist. Now, the obvious trend is to make these devices smaller and smaller and smaller. And obviously, the next step after the watch, where do you think it's gonna go? It wouldn't be very surprising. In fact, there are a lot of computers that they are actually implanted inside our body. Those are referred to as what we call the body integrated electronic devices. I don't know if you see this or not, but this is actually what we do in the lab that we have there. This is actually an electronic tattoo with a display. So it actually can show you a number on your hand, which is basically just an electronic tattoo, which is becoming very, very commonly used. Now, nowadays, you have sensors, you have cameras that you can actually swallow and you can actually take pictures. So these are really computers which we can actually implant those in our body. Now, so what's, what's happening really is on one hand, the computers are becoming more and more and more powerful. On the other hand, they're becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you have these very, very small yet powerful devices, it doesn't, it obviously makes sense to actually keep those for, at all times and use them at every aspect of our, of our lives. So to that end, what's going on right now is that we actually use our cell phone for every aspect of our lives. We use it for making phone calls, of course, but we also use it for keeping contacts, make, getting information, listening to music, chatting, shopping, finding direction. We use all of these using our cell phone. Not surprisingly, in a recent survey that they did, they found out that 60% of us will stay away from our cell phone only one hour a day. One hour a day. That means we are with our cell phone 23 hours. That's assuming that even when you're, when you're sleeping, you actually have the cell phone right next to you. So this is very interesting because cell phones are in reality are becoming the, an, a very integrated part of our life. Without cell phone, one can claim that we're really lost. I mean, we're really in trouble if we don't have our cell phones right next to us, right? So it's very important to understand this in order to kind of see how it's impacting us. Now, before we continue, I just wanted to spend a little time explaining how the internet works. And it's important for us to understand how the internet works 
before we understand how the internet can actually be exploited. So to do that, let me just bring out a couple of examples. In order to actually get connected to the internet, you need three things. You need your enabled device, internet enabled devices, like a, such as cell phones. You also need your ISP, otherwise known as internet service provider. So examples of ISP are like your AT&T, Verizon, and all of those companies that you basically pay to get internet, right? But in addition to that, you also need a connection. That is a connection between you, wherever you are, and your ISP. This is a physical connection. When they say, you know, the computer has this virtual stuff in it, there's really nothing virtual about computer. Every single thing you type, every single message that you send from here goes through your ISP. ISP effectively sees everything that comes to you and goes out. Now, let's say you want to get connected to a friend on the other side of the globe using the internet. Well, you create a message using your computer. Let's say you want to send an email. You create a message, you send that through the wires, it goes through the ISP, and then it goes to your friend. Now, through this process, you are actually sending information, but in addition to the information, you are also sending two very important pieces of information, and that's your addresses. Effectively, there are two addresses that every time you send a message on, over the internet, that's stuck with that particular message. Those two are one is the IP address, otherwise known as internet protocol address, which is given to you by your ISP. The other address is basically the serial number of your device. It doesn't matter whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a computer, it's basically a serial number which is always attached to your device. It's interesting that last month there was actually this law that's being proposed to the Congress to make it illegal anyone changing the serial number of your device. This is very important in the context of overall tracking because if you basically cannot change the serial number of a device, it's always trackable. Now, of course, the argument for that is that, well, if your device gets stolen, for example, and if the div get to change the serial device, then there's no way of finding it, right? So that's the other side of the argument. Now, every time you actually access a particular server, let's say Facebook, what happens is that, say with that, is that that particular server actually puts out something on your computer. We refer to that as the cookie. It is actually called cookie. It's basically a very simple piece of code that's put on your computer. So next time, when you want to actually contact the same server, now you send your message, but the cookie is all also attached with that message. So the cookie and the message, which it also contains your IP address as well as the serial number, it's actually being transmitted from wherever you are to wherever you're trying to reach, such as, for example, save uh, Facebook uh, page. Now, if you look at the whole thing kind of from a very top level, you kind of see that in order to get connected to the internet, you need this ISP. But then when you get to, when you, and it's really the ISP that connects you to these servers. Now, something interesting happens. The ISP has a lot of information on you. For one thing, they have your credit card. They know exactly where you live. So they have your social security number. So every packet, every message that goes through these, they can associate that information with you. Now, you may say, well, all these are encrypted. That means there's no way anybody can see that. That is absolutely true. The message that you're sending through the ISP is completely encrypted. What is not encrypted is your address. This is just like your neighbor going into your mailbox every single day. He never opens up the mail. But what he can see, what he will record, is just where you're sending your mail to and where is it coming from. By just having that, what we call metadata, which is just the addressing portion of it, and it's not encrypted. By just having that, it, after a while, it's very obvious who you associate with, who you contact with, what kind of stuff that you read, what kind of site you visit, and so forth. So those are the information that are readily available to this ISP. On the other hand, every time you access a website, for example, Facebook, Amazon, Yahoo, or Gmail, these guys also record a bunch of information from people. Now, they're not doing it because they want to cause any harm. They're doing it because they want to actually provide 
facilitate your, the service that they are providing to you. For example, Amazon wants to keep track of what you like to buy. If they know what you like to buy, next time when you actually log into Amazon's page using the cookie, they can figure out who you are. So they basically, the first thing that you see are those advertising which are more prevalent to your interest. Now there are certain things that all of these guys keep track of. For example, they actually know obviously your login name, if you, what kind of messages you're sending, the timeline that you actually, uh, uh, the timeline of different activities that you have, for example, on Facebook page. But there are also s some not so obvious information that they have about us. And again, none of these things are bad inherently. I'm just basically saying how it works. And they do that. If you to talk to Facebook engineers, they say, well, this is the only way I can actually provide you a good service. Now, in addition to login information and timeline activities, Facebook, for example, has access to a lot of our pictures. But they can, using their face recognition system, they can easily kind of identify who is who. And uh, they're becoming more and more sophisticated in that. In addition to that, obviously, because they actually have access to where we click, what kind of likes and dislikes we have, they can kind of learn about us. It is, there, is a, was, there was a study some times ago, and it basically said that if you do 350 likes and dislikes, Facebook knows you better than your mother. That means using the algorithm that Facebook has, by doing these likes and dislikes, they can actually have enough information, assuming everything is true, of course, they can have enough information about you to predict how you're thinking. Recently, you probably, you probably know that Facebook has come up with this third option. It's like, dislike, and what's the other third option? What is it? Yeah, maybe or something. I think it's, I'm sorry? Yeah, there are actually different reactions. It's not, they're basically expanding the reaction of people. It's not just like or dislike. And through that, they believe they even can find out more information about the user. So they can facilitate a better experience, online experience for the user. Now, obviously, with all this information, it is very likely to understand, it's not surprisingly, that any, whether it's ISP or any of the servers, can easily tell, like when you're sending an email, they can easily tell where you are. It's, the, it's embedded in the technology, again. So when you send an email, you can easily tell where that email came from. Uh, a few years ago, I had, a, I had a student, actually, that apparently her husband at some time sent her these emails that, honey, I'm stuck at home, at work, and I can't come, for example. So the email, she actually traced the email and she found out that every time he, the husband, is actually sending that email, he happens to be in a bar in downtown Santa Rosa. So it's very easy to actually track any emails to see where it's coming from. Of course, since two years ago, many of the servers are actually blocking that information. The location information inside email is no longer readily available to any user. Now, I want to point out a new concept, which is also important when we actually get connected to the internet. And that is the concept of finding the IP address. So as we said, let's say, for example, I'm trying to access Facebook.com. That information needs to go to the ISP. The ISP gets that request that, hey, this person wants to get connected to Facebook.com, for example. Then what happens is that the ISP doesn't really know what Facebook.com is. This concept is very similar to going to the library. When you go to the library, let's say you're looking for a book, let's call it, for example, Kingdom of Injustice. You go to the library and you say, I'm looking for Kingdom of Injustice. What do you think will happen next? What happens after you ask the library, do you have this book or not? What do you think the library will do? They actually have to go to the directory, right? They say, check the computer, check the directory. So when you check the directory, what do you get? You get a call number, right? So all the books are there, the titles are there, but each title is associated with a call number. That's how you can actually go to the shelf and pull out the book, right? So in the internet world, that's exactly how it is. Facebook.com doesn't really mean anything. It's just like the title of the book. Really what we need to find out in order to go and be able to find the book, we need to have the IP address. So there is actually that directory that actually helps us to find the call number for every book and it's in the library. That directory in the internet world is called the DNS, 
which is stands for domain name server or domain name system. This is the guy. So every request that basically you send to your ISP, let's say I want to check, for example, Twitter. I want to send a Twitter. I want to send, uh, I want to listen to music and I, I want to listen to Pandora or Spotify. That request goes to the DNS and D DNS comes back with a call number otherwise known as IP address. That IP address, now that's available, the ISP is going to use that IP address and actually go and find where Facebook.com is going to be. So a couple of weeks ago, last week, or this week actually, last week, something happened. You know what happened is that all of a sudden this server, which used to be, which is actually located in the East Coast, all of a sudden experienced something really weird. And that was millions and millions and millions of requests all of a sudden, they overloaded that whole server. So how did that happen? It's kind of like going to the, all of us from here, going to the run to the library, and each one of us start asking for a book from the librarian. What do you think will happen to the librarian? Or they, I mean, she's going to get overloaded, and eventually she's not going to do anything. She's not even going to give any of us any book. Do you agree? So this is exactly what happened to this over the East Coast. What happens is that millions of devices started sending these requests, dummy requests, to this DNS server. So the DNS server got really, really overloaded, and it stopped working. It says, I can't take this thing. So as a result of that, the DNS was not able to send any IP address back. So you couldn't get any call number. You couldn't get, find out the address for the site that you were trying to find. Therefore, the ISP could never actually get to the site that you're looking for. Therefore, over 1,200 1, servers were unreachable, simply because we couldn't find their address. Spotify, Netflix, Twitter, Facebook, all of those were affected, particularly in Southern California and around East Coast. So, the cell phone technology works very, very similar to the, to the internet. The only big difference, however, is the fact that in the cell phone technology, in cell phone world, instead of these computers, we actually use these handheld devices. Now the thing is, the handheld devices have some extended capabilities. For example, if you actually open up your cell phone, you don't really see much. You only see a, pieces, a few pieces of metal. But this guy, who happens to be the brain of your cell phone, on this guy, you will see some interesting features. And there are four of them that are very interesting, that are, happen to be very interesting to me. In particular, one of them is a GPS. The other one is a GSM antenna that actually allows us to get connected to the tower, to the cell tower, and talk. Another one is a Wi-Fi antenna, which you go home and you get connected to the internet using Wi-Fi. And finally, the Bluetooth antenna. Now, these four technologies are really, really, really cool. Really interesting. I mean, I teach courses on every one of these, and each one is actually a whole, whole course, right? They even have graduate version of that. But here's the thing. The thing is, these technologies, even though they're really cool, but there are some weird stuff that's going on inside them. There are some weird embedded features that we have to understand those. Now, let's talk about G GPS first. Well, you all know GPS is basically used for figuring out where the location is. Obviously, GPS is basically communicating with a satellite. It uses triangulation, and it actually pinpoints where you are. Now, most of us think, well, if my GPS is off, nobody can actually track me. But the fact of the matter is, the service provider that you actually get your cell phone from, they can actually turn on your GPS at any point of time use, given a warrant from a judge. They can actually turn it on and figure out exactly where you are. But even if you break your GPS, by the very fact that your GSM antenna is on, even though you're not talking to anyone, as you're driving from one tower to another, by triangulating these antennas, they can actually figure out exactly where you are, even though you're not talking. But the way this thing, the GSM antenna works, is that as you, right now, right now, if somebody could listen to all of your cell phones, each of your cell phones is saying, hey, I'm Jason's phone, I'm Jason's phone, I'm Jason's phone. 
Somebody else is going to say, I'm Mary's phone. I'm Mary's phone. So uh, your phone right now in this room, they're all screaming their names. So if, as soon as you actually get out, now they're going to scream louder to other, cell, to other cell towers. This is how we can actually pick up the phone at any given time and actually make a phone call without a delay. Because that's the only way. Because even though we are not using our phone, but you, our phone is actually trying to make connection with the cell tower. And that's exactly how, while we are actually not using our phone, but the cell phones are actively communicating with the cell, phone, cell tower. And through that, we can actually, they can figure out exactly where you are located at. So there is actually a location tracking using the cell phone. Now, in addition to the GPS and GSM, there are two really cool technologies also embedded in our phones. One of them is a Wi-Fi. The other one is low power energy Bluetooth. So the same way that GSM is constantly shouting the serial number or the name of your phone, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is also doing exactly the same thing. You may think, well, nobody has their Bluetooth on unless they are listening to music. Well, I don't think that's the case because, you know, imagine, for example, you're actually in a, you have one of those cars, which is becoming more and more common, that you can actually make phone calls hand-free. You know, the cars that actually have Bluetooth. Well, your Bluetooth is on. How many of us, when we actually leave the car, we turn off our Bluetooth? Probably very few of us, right? So the very fact that we just get out of the car, that means our Bluetooth is on. Same thing, your Wi-Fi is typically on when you actually get out of the house. In fact, when you get in, automatically your Wi-Fi becomes available. So the point is, all of these technologies are always on. And they have this signal called beacon. Beacon is basically saying, introducing yourself. Hey, I'm the Bluetooth from Jason's phone. I'm the Bluetooth from Jason's phone. I'm the Bluetooth from Jason's phone. By keep saying that, right by processing that information, it is very easy to see where you are and what you're doing and what, finding out the location. This kind of technology is particularly interested for inside shopping malls, for example, where your GPS or antenna is not very accurate. Let's say you're going from one shop to another. It's like, how do they know? Well, it's through the shouting that's happening through your Bluetooth or Wi-Fi information that's coming out of your phone. As you're going from one store to another, using the Bluetooth and using the Wi-Fi signals, stores can easily tell that, hey, this guy is actually moving from here to here. Using Bluetooth information, stores can even tell you which particular department you're going, which racks you're getting the clothes out of, and what is it that you're trying. For example, if you're trying different shoes or different, actually, uh, type of clothes, Right now, there are a lot of technology that actually pinpoint our exact location within malls or pinpoint exactly what kind of merchandise we're interested in. In some cases, they can even tell how long you were actually playing with a particular merchandise before you purchase it. They can tell how long it took us to actually stand in the queue and until we get out of the store. So all of that information is merely evident through these beacon signals that's coming out of our phone. Now, you probably have seen this. Those of you who are using your cell phone to actually pay for something, you have something called near-field communication inside your phone. Again, that's one of those technologies that's constantly shouting, hey, I'm here, hey, I'm here, hey, I'm here. Now, the thing about this technology is that it's slightly different from, for example, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi because it has a very limited range. That range is only 20 centimeters or so. That's why when you go to a Starbucks, you want to pay, you have to actually get your phone really close to the cash register because of this. Now, how is that useful? Well, this is actually useful to figure out, let's say you're standing in a particular position and you're touching different shoes or different clothes and you want, they want to know exactly which shoes or clothes you're actually playing with or choosing. So for near or low or short range communication or tracking, this device can actually be very useful. Now, it's interesting that, you know, for example, right now there are technologies that, for example, let's say you go to a mall and then your phone is on and all of a sudden they know exactly which store you are in and using that technology they can tell you the coupons for the clothes which are on sale on that, in that particular store. 
or they can actually tell you that, hey, if you go to the shoes department, there are a couple cool shoes that you may be interested in. Now, what's happening is that that information is tied to the searches that we are doing online. For example, you go on Amazon.com, you're looking for red shoes. That information is safe. Remember how all these sites basically have these cookies and they know us and they know what kind of merchandises we are searching for? Now, they tie that information with our location information, which is basically provided to these companies using these screaming or these Bluetooth or Wi-Fi screaming technologies. So they tie them together. For example, let's say you're looking for a house. And then you're actually passing by a particular street. And all of a sudden, your cell phone says, hey, by the way, there's actually a house available here for sale. Are you interested to see this is the location? Now, one of the cool places that also these kind of technology is being used is at the airport. And you might have actually seen this. I, go, I happen to go to Houston a lot. But in Houston Airport, for example, there is actually, you can see a sign like this. It says, estimated waiting time at the security check is so long. It's like, how do they know that? Well, you know what? They actually use the signal, the beacon signal coming out of our cell phones in many cases. And using that, they can actually see how long we are actually standing for how long it took us to actually go through the queue. Now, using this information, well, there are actually a lot of companies nowadays, data analytic companies, that all they do is just say, they say, hey, give me all this beacon information, and I give you a lot of other information about this particular person or individual. Or I don't ha they don't have to know me. But they only have to know that I am holding this phone with some serial number. Nobody's interested to know what's my name or what exactly am I doing. But they are just interested to figure out my habit, my location habit, what places I'm interested to go with, in. How much, what's my daily routine? What roads do I pass by? Those are the kind of information that especially advertisers are interested in. So they can actually, supposedly, provide better services to individuals and consumers. There is a company, it's called Turnstyle. The Turnstyle, all they do is basically get all these beacon information that companies or malls, for example, collect. And they basically just provide them all this information. And through those information, through the beacons, they can actually figure out all this information. What is the person doing? What places they're going? How much time do they spend in their coffee shop? And so forth. And based on that, they create an advertising profile per phone. Now, you probably have downloaded a lot of apps, right? So what, what happens is that every time you download an app, something like this comes up, that this app will be using your contact information and location position, locations and all this. Have you seen that? What do you typically do when they say, when they say is it OK to ac actually access your contact, your location? Most of us say, yeah, sure, why not, right? But you know, the fact of the matter is nowadays, data is the most valuable commodity for a lot of companies and advertisers. In fact, it's almost as good as cash. Now, in addition to that, the fact that we spend 90% of our time on the mobile devices using the app makes it even more interesting for different advertisers to develop these apps, which supposedly just does a lot of different different things for us. Maybe it's just gaming, or maybe it's a dictionary app. But in return, it collects data. One of the most valuable data that people, that advertisers are inter interested to collect about us is our location, where we go, our whereabouts, how much time we spend in each place, and so forth. So have you ever, for example, wondered why Angry Bird is interested to figure out your location? Or why Angry Bird is interested to figure out your contacts? Well, the whole point behind Angry Bird is to make sure that they can you actually play with something, but at the same time, they get the data out of you, right? And it's not, again, this is not a vicious thing against us. It's just basically by getting the data, they claim, the companies, advertisers, are claiming that I can provide you better and more sufficient, um, facilitate better service. That's their reason. Now, the problem, however, with many of these apps that we just kind of blindly just put on our cell phones and just start using is the fact that they actually introduce us to a lot of security invulner vulnerabilities. Uh, a study by Hewlett Packard last year actually showed that when you actually download an app, you put yourself in 97% of times because these apps effectively um, decrypt 
a lot of the information in our cell phones. Perhaps one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, probably uh, heard example was the case for Starbucks, the early Starbucks application that came out. So what happened is that the Starbucks gave us this application that we could actually pay for our coffee. But it turned out that when you actually install the application, it actually makes all the information available to anyone else to steal it out of our phone. So it's, with respect to the account for the Starbucks. For example, someone could actually see how much money we have in, the, in our Starbucks account. And they could actually get all that login information. So the point is that a lot of these apps, unfortunately, they are done in a very lousy way, and which compromise the security inside our phone. Maybe one of the most interesting apps I've ever seen is this guy. This guy, this app, actually tells you how much you walk a day, how much you sleep, uh, how much rest time you have, how much you're driving during the day, how much you actually stare at a particular thing. I don't know how they can figure all these things out. But at the end of the day, when you sleep, it actually gives you a number. That's your productivity day. That's the productivity number which is stamped for that day. Now, it's really cool because like for, a, for a, let's say, I want to look at my productivity over the last month. And I get 30 numbers. And every day I can see, oh, my productivity on Sunday was great. On Monday, my productivity all of a sudden went down because I had to go to work, right? Now, imagine, for example, your boss is interested in that information. Do you think it would be available to your boss or to your supervisor to see that kind of information? I mean, would it make sense, for example, all of a sudden your boss says, hey, can I get this information from you? Well, you probably think, well, no, not really. But you know what? A couple of years ago in Maryland, actually, the Department of Corrections started asking for passwords to the social media from their employers. And they said, well, if you work here, you got to show us uh, the password to your Facebook. Well, granted that after a couple of years, currently, in fact, um, almost in, um, in uh, almost 12 states, it's illegal to actually ask for the password to anyone's social media. So that law is actually not working in 12 states, but it's actually there in the remaining states. So it's still possible that somewhere, for example, in particularly in Texas, all of a sudden somebody asked for the password for your social media. But this is a long time ago. Well, this was five years ago. It probably doesn't happen, you know? But the fact is, last week, something interesting happened. The, depart the actual the Custom Border and Protection Agents they submitted a proposal. They said from now on, whoever wants to have a visa waiver and wants to enter the United States should provide the online profile to the Facebook and Twitter and whatever else that they can give us. So next time, when you want to get a visa to go to a country, you have to give them your social, social media information, which is kind of weird. Like, for example, if you want to go to Spain, the first thing they're going to ask you is, like, can I get your Twitter handle, please, before I give you a visa? So that kind of attitude is there. And a lot of government and a lot of uh, agencies are effectively just pretty much come very forward and they say, well, can I get this information from you before I can serve you? Now, um, you know, internet has truly changed our lives. There's no doubt about that. These mobile devices, they facilitate our lives. There's no doubt that our life compared to 10 years ago is completely changed. But it's also important to understand that this tool, because of the way it is being designed, it actually provides these capabilities to advertisers, governments, other people who, are, uh, who have the capabilities and capacity. They can utilize these available tools, and they can actually use them to exploit users. Now, what can we do is the, really the question. I mean, okay, well, they don't have, for example, they track me in the mall. They know where I am. They know I'm going from one store to another store. It's like, what can I do? There's nothing I can do. I need my phone, right? But in fact, I think, I argue that there are a lot of things we can do. And in fact, each one of us in this room can actually do something. And perhaps the most important thing is, you know, what, it's one thing to actually give our data voluntarily. That's, that's a different thing. But at the same time, I think it is our right to own the personal data that belongs to us. I think it's very important that if an application is actually requesting for our data, we actually somehow, we have the capacity. 
we have the right to actually know where this data is going, who is going to look at it, and how secure it is. It's very important that companies, we demand these transparencies from companies. You know, I think whoever actually has access to our data, they should also make sure that this data is not going to be hacked by hackers, and this data is completely going to, is, is going to be completely private. Now, this unfortunately has not been the case. Let me just give you a three, three examples that happened over the last year. Uh, for example, perhaps you heard that Target stores, uh, basically, uh, they got hacked. And over 70 million users with credit cards and debit cards from, from actually uh, Target, uh, those accounts were all compromised. Soon after that, Neiman Marcus got hacked. And then about 1.1 customers, basically their account got compromised. And finally, Yahoo, that it, it, was, it ended up that in 2012, they had been hacked and 200 million accounts were compromised. That includes all the information about their password, their username, all of this information were actually out. Now, about Yahoo, it's kind of an interesting story, and let me just share it with you for just, just a minute. So what happened in 2000, 2012, there was a guy by the name of, his name was, he was a cyberspace, a cyber criminal. Um, so he actually put out in the dark web, which is a web, which is not accessible via your uh, browser, so you have to actually do some other stuff to actually see the dark web. So he put an ad, he says, hey, I have 200 million records that I just hacked from Yahoo. Anybody is interested to buy this or not? So how much do you think was the price to actually for that 200 million accounts? Just guess. He was selling this whole thing for mere $1,800. He was saying, give me $1,800, I'll give you all of these accounts. Then, you know what happened is that when he actually did that, this was the time that Yahoo was going through the process of acquisition being acquired by Verizon. So Verizon was actually buying Yahoo. So Yahoo didn't want to confirm that, because had they confirmed it, then Verizon would say, well, I'm not going to buy a company that just loses 200 an account, 200 million account. So they didn't confirm it. Then what happened is that some of these uh, reporters actually went to the guy. The guy was called the cyber criminal, called Peace. That was his name, online name. And then they say, well, send us like 1,000 of these 200 million. Let's see how, how many of them are really true. So he actually sent them about a thousand of those names. And what happened, sure enough, they actually found out a lot of these information are actually correct. So they called Yahoo and said, hey, this is true. He's not faking it. So at that point, Yahoo had to actually confirm. The point here is that the companies are willing to compromise our data for their own interest. And that's something that we should be aware of. And we should definitely demand for more transparency and security. Now, you know, um, again, technology certainly facilitated our lives. But it's also important that we don't take technology as, uh, it, at, at its face value. It's very important that we are aware of the enabling technologies that exist in different devices, in different apps that we actually install. Because if we don't do that, these technologies can have really adverse impact on the way we live. That's why it is extremely important for all of us that sitting here to be aware of these, the consequences of these technologies and to understand that we can't just sit here. So we cannot just be <laughs> passive uh, consumers. So let me just leave you with this quote from Marshall McCollum who said, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. I think this is extremely important because if we continue being just passive users and passive customers and we just blindly take any technology that's thrown us, that they have thrown us at us without understanding the impact, I think we have done a grave disservice to the future generation. Because right now, we're really shaping the tools of the tomorrow. We're shaping the way the next generation will live. And in this room, all of us are responsible for that. 
And if we just become quiet and we just use whatever game, Pokemon, Angry Bird, whatever they throw at us, we just constantly just use it without understanding what it's doing to us, I think it's not just impacting us, but it's also impacting the future generation. Thank you. So. How do they track us? Yeah, for example, right. I think, again, you have to understand, I'm not, remember the movie you were watching? I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to say that everything we do, we are being tracked, and it's like the whole world is basically, Big Brother is just watching us. I'm not saying that. I think my point is that the technology we're using, these things are in there. They are embedded parts of the way we use the technology. Now, whether they use it or not, that's a different story. But I think my whole premise is that fact that it is important for us to participate in a discussion which makes us to understand, for example, why is it illegal if I change my, my, uh, the serial number of my device? Now, to go back to your question, I think the GPS is just happened to be one of those cases that, as you mentioned correctly, one of the cool approach, one of the cool uh, applications of the GPS is to actually monitor the traffic on road, right? Based on the GPS tracking on my phone, they can actually monitor how the traffic on highway is, which is a really, really useful thing. That's exactly how Waze, have you used Waze, for example, to find your way? That's exactly how Waze basically finds out, using your GPS and how fast you're trying. So in that, that way, it is a, they're tracking us, yes, but I like them to track me because they actually help me this service. But then again, who else has access to this information? That is really the question. The question is, how secure is that data? And that's something that we collectively have to sit down and understand and basically demand a better privacy from all these companies. Does that make sense? Right. I think the problem is not that the Starbucks doesn't have money, so they just want to come up with something really quick. After all, the Starbucks application can only be used at the Starbucks. I think the problem is lack of concern for consumers. The problem is lack of demand from us. If we demand that, hey, if it's Starbucks, next time they do something like this, I'm not going to buy anything from a Starbucks. I'm pretty sure Starbucks will actually spend a lot more resources and they'll be a lot more careful in the kind of application that they have. Um, a similar thing probably happened to, I don't know if you remember, some time ago Apple came up with this, they had a bug. If you hold the phone in a certain way, actually it messes up things, right? Do you remember that? Like there was an antenna problem. If you hold the phone in a certain way, you could actually drop the call. So one of those things, I mean, that was a big deal. But what happened is that we, we actually demanded better product. And it was through that that actually made sure that this, something like this never happened. If we never demand anything, if we don't care about our privacy, if we don't care about the kind of information they get from us, and we don't care about what they do with it, then they don't really feel they are accountable to anything. They say, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to make, it sh I'm gonna make sure it doesn't happen again. But the fact is, we, it's up to us to actually take this one step further and make sure whatever application that we demand clear and transparency, clarity and transparency from the companies that make application and make sure that our data is kept secure. Did I answer your question? Sure. Sorry. Uh 
we as individuals in the first place, I think every one of us that are in this room, it's very important for us, for example, that when we actually get an app, we understand, first of all, we ask, if it's a game, why is it looking for my location, for example? Who is actually, who is this company sharing my information with? What kind of measurements do they have in terms of actually securing my data? I think those are some of the questions that are very critical. I'm not saying, well, every app that you, from now on, you download, I mean, it probably doesn't happen. You actually go to their web page, call their CEO, and ask questions. But I think it's important that the companies overall understand that this generation, us, all of us, individually, we are very concerned about our privacy, and we really don't want the data to be hacked by other hackers. So do whatever it is, make sure the data is secure. And if you don't keep it secure, I'm not going to go to Target again. I'm not going to go and have an account or email with Yahoo. I'm not going to buy anything from Neiman Marcus. They don't see that. They don't really see that even if Neiman Marcus, 1.1 million people get hacked, or 3 million people at Target get hacked, they don't see anything will happen to their purchase level. And that's a problem. You know? And I think that's something that we have to make sure they understand. And that, we do it at individual level. Yeah. I think it's definitely the responsibility to make sure that we understand what they're doing. For example, if they are actually tracking our beacon signals when we're going to the mall, there should be a sign there that you are actually, we are listening to your beacon signal. So everybody should know that. Now, I may say, okay, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But maybe somebody else doesn't like that. But the fact that they do it without us knowing, I think that's a problem. Similarly, if there's an application, for example, that, for example, uh, I mean, you probably have seen this thing. You go to, let's say you buy a new car, and then all of a sudden you give them your email and contact information, and after that, all of a sudden you get this, this mirage of all of these advertisers sending you emails and sending you all these, uh, these advertising from different commodities. I mean, you get upset, right? You call them and say, why do you give my information to somebody else? The same thing goes with all these other companies that basically come up with apps. So I think, it's, again, it's important for us to basically uh, not necessarily do it with every single app, but it's important for us to actually demonstrate that we do care. And if you mess up, I'm not going to use your product again. I'm not going to use your second version. I'm not going to go to your and buy something else from, from then on. If, for example, Amazon, something happens to Amazon, I probably will tell Amazon that unless I'm pretty sure that you keep my data secret or private, I'm not going to buy anything from you. Somebody else had a question. I think, so you're asking how, what it, right. So let's just, I think to really understand, and I think, I don't know if you guys do any projects or not, but maybe one really interesting project is to actually look at the privacy acts that are in place in Europe versus the privacy act in the United States. Just compare those, and you realize that Privacy acts in Europe, they are at much more effective and much more rigorous in terms of making sure consumers', pro, uh, consumers pro, uh, privacy is protected. For example, if I have a data that somehow you collected my information, and um, let's say a year from now, I realize, hey, I really didn't mean to give you that data. Now I want it back. In the United States, there's no way you can do that. In Europe, there are actually provisions that you can actually get your data back if they don't want it, or you can wipe out your digital data. In US, it is almost impossible, almost, not completely, but almost impossible to actually get, get rid of your the digital footprint. 
Because you basically give the company your entire data, and from then on, it's theirs. They have the ownership. Whereas in Europe, for example, there are provisions which the consumer can actually ask for his data back, or he can actually wipe out the data. So these are some of the things that really, as individuals, we demand, and we expect governments to actually help us to succeed and gain those rights. What kind of rights? Those are the privacy rights that we are actually demanding. That this is my data. So if at any time, at any point of life, if I don't want you to have it, I want to have it back. So yes, I think we have to demand it, and it's up to the government to actually do things like that. And remember, governments do stuff like that. Child labor was one of the things that governments actually stepped out, and they said, hey, from now on, no children should be working. 40 hours a week was one of those things that was actually set by the government. There are a lot of things. For example, seat belts are basically, those laws are made by the government. So the same way, I think it's understandable, it's feasible to think that governments can actually pass law to protect consumers. And stuff like that are being happened. I'm just saying perhaps by demanding more, there could be more laws to protect consumers. Well, I think one of the things that happened is um, maybe an example, the example that exists in Europe, for example, could actually be one of those cases that, uh, yes, they may benefit from it, but at the same time, ultimately, governments are supposed to protect consumers. Um, and in many cases, of course, depending on who gets elected, in the next election, things may actually change a lot, right? But the point is that I think it is not unlikely to actually, the public, ask the government to protect them. But at the same time, if NSA wants to, for example, keep track of people, criminal terrorists, for whatever reason, they can have their own tools later on, right? But at the same time, I don't think the government, for example, should have uh, a capability that blindly collect, for example, uh, telephone information or data with respect to all Americans, for example. It actually collects a lot of data from different people without them, any of them being convicted. At the same time, I think the same way, I don't think, for example, if uh, companies such as Facebook or Gmail, if they collect the data, it, first of all, it has to be, we have to make sure that we actually agreed with that. We have to understand the rules. They have to be transparent with us. And at the same time, ultimately, if I don't want them to have my data, I can have it back. I mean, those are the things that I think we should, we should really make it clear. And unless there's a demand again, there's really, they are not going to do anything. And I think as collectively, I think we can actually create a very strong uh, platform to demand this kind of law. Sure. I was curious if you either you know of any software or you think it's going to be developed that would make it for like a VPN to protect, protect you on your own right? Sure. Yeah, there are actually an, a lot of software actually for VPN. You can actually buy those, you can install those. Uh, you can even put VPN on a browser. In fact, there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a site, it's called protectyourass.com, by the way. Uh, you can actually go on that site, and it creates a VPN. And uh, what happens is that every time you use your browser, it can protect you. So no, no cookies will be installed. Nobody can tell exactly where you are. So it hides your IP address. Yes, there are technologies like that. But you have to understand that whatever technology you use, they, it has a creator. That creator also knows how to bypass that. Right? So it's really the game of cat and mouse. Somebody designs a technology, somebody makes a technology better than that. Somebody actually comes up with something better. So it keeps constantly evolving. So for example, even if you're using VPN, it's still hackable. We can still, it just depends on, yes, maybe I can't do that. Maybe no one at this school can do it. But I'm pretty sure like FBI or someone in NSA can do that. 
So the point is, we just, it's not so much about technology. The technology can always be broken one way or another. It's the fact that you shouldn't do that. You should not, as government or, for example, advertisers, you should not go and collect data on me without my permission. I think that's the key that we have to actually stress. Does that make sense? So The web, it's basically a web page with actually ads. Uh, the name might have changed because they recently actually, the, the site actually was bought by another company. But you can actually find a similar website. So but does it apply to Trump as well for something No, this is, uh, no, I don't think they, at, at least the tool I've used, it doesn't really apply for a phone. But you should be able to find a VPN for phones. Uh, I mean, there are available. Sure. I think the logic question would be, what did you lose as people who use technology if somebody like, takes our information away from us, right? And that would be one part of the bigger question that you know, like, why should we be aware, you know, what, what are we losing? And if her, uh, Professor Birmingham can actually help you to answer that, because I think that I want the whole class to think about that. Another part would be, you know, the very simple way that we can actually interact with Right. I think without getting into too much detail, I think the biggest problem is that we don't know. That unknown is a problem. I don't know how you're going to use my information a year from now, two years from now. I don't know how that's going to be used. I don't know. The fact that you never wipe out my information is a problem because I don't know how you're going to use it in two years. Do you see that? So the very fact that we, that piece of equation is unknown is alarming to me. So it's not about what do you have on me right now and what can you use. I don't know. You may not have anything useful on me right now. But in two years, you may actually use it in some way against me. And that is the problem. So in fact, one can argue right now, I may give you this information. But two years from now, I may actually find out that you're using it adversely against me. Therefore, I want my piece of information back. And I should have, the, as individuals, we should have the right to actually get those information back. Or, for example, right now, when you delete an email, it doesn't really get deleted. It actually stays on their server for 90 days. That's what they claim. For example, any email that you actually delete from Gmail or Facebook, it actually stays by their own account. It stays there for at least 90 days. Right? It may, in some cases, it may actually stay there for much longer. So the point, I think, really the problem is we don't know. And that unknown thing is very alarming. But on the other hand, like also consider like if, if I have your email account, you may have multiple accounts. In fact, there was a study that said 58% of young people give fake or unused email to get deals. So many of us don't give the exact, the main primary email address, right? But the point is, in even that little information that we sometimes give away, there's a lot of stuff. For example, in our email, they send us uh, information about our account, our bank account, our university. So there's a lot of information that we may not know, we may not think about, but it's actually there. And someone who has hacked into our account can actually find out about us. Sure. Right. To right. For the layperson. So if you're actively trying to figure out and understand.
understand how your information is being used. You can't figure it out. That's true. So here, uh, I think I totally agree with you. Like, good luck with some of us that want to actually read the, the terms of agreement, right? That's a very, very tedious job. But the point is, it gets to a time, it gets to a point that I think we need help from maybe higher level of, of uh, government agent, for example. Maybe that's, that is, if the problem is, if you actually demand this kind of, uh, if you actually demand more protection, I think at some point the government has to step in and protect our rights. So you're right. It's like, what can I do when I get these long term of agreements and I don't even understand what they are talking about, right? But it's at that point that I think it's the government's job to actually say, listen, make this very, very clear. And they have done this. They have done it with, for example, your electricity bills. They have done it with video and cable bills. So there are other steps that have been taken in other areas. So we're basically saying, make this the same way and make it simple for people to understand what they're doing. I th and I think it's doable. It, but we just, again, we just have to kind of, as a whole, as as a society, we have to actually bring out the importance and show that we are, this is what we are asking for. Or just tell the companies that I'm not going to use this thing until I clearly understand this. You know? um, so that kind of demand, I think it actually brings in. Or you know, people who I get elected is like one of the key things. Nobody really pays too much attention to that. But it's like, what's your position on this kind of a stuff? I mean, that could be one of the questions that we can always ask our legislators. Are we good? Thank you. Thanks.